Um, so what we're going to do um, over the course of the next sort of 45 minutes to an hour is we, uh, we're going to have something of a conversation about uh, reactions, thoughts about what this actually might mean in practice, some of the difficult, interesting and um, um, challenging opportunities that arise. But I thought before we did that, I'd sort of let you in on, on the kind of a little bit of the process of how we, we, um, we talked about the potential of um, immersive experiences uh, alongside live performance um, with the, the kind of decision makers who we had to talk to and persuade that this should be in the funding in the first place. Because it's, it is just worth, Andrew said it in a rather more politic way than I will, this, we just don't get this kind of money in our sector. This just never happens. And so, um, and that is partly because of a sort of comprehension gap in policy makers and decision makers. Uh, it's partly because um, it's actually genuinely really hard to pin down what research and development means in our sectors as opposed to in the harder science sectors. And that is reasonable um, that that's a challenge. It's also partly because there is no such thing as the creative industries, as lots of you were thinking. There are lots of subsectors. There are lots of sectors that actually are competing directly against each other. But one of the, the one of the kind of really rare things, and I'd been, I founded a company in '95 in digital media. I was in theatre before that. Um, that one of the things that's been very rare through this process has been um, the, the level of unanimity around the, both the importance of potential and actually potential threat um, of, of some of these new technologies. I'm not going to reiterate Andrew's opening, which I thought was extremely clear sort of enunciation. I do also think I see similarities between where we are now and, and the, the sort of launch of the web. So, so as a producer, I've, I've been involved in web, I've been involved in TV, I've been involved in games. Um, I've made augmented reality for PlayStation. I've put plays on at the Dunmo and at the Royal Opera House, not the Royal House, the English National Opera, various places. Um, I, I sort of run across media, and, and, and that's my, 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 my milieu. It's a sort of jack of all trades and not yet a master of any. Um, but in, in, in trying to persuade um, policymakers and in successfully persuading policymakers, we, we, we basically had to kind of give a vision. Um, not of what it would be, but of what might happen if we got this right. And so this is kind of fatuous for an audience of professional policy people and uh, professional performance people. It's not fatuous for an audience of professional policy people who are actually asking us genuinely, yeah, but you're really just going to build a theatre somewhere, aren't you? You're just going to use the money for something else. Or you're basically going to subsidise the things the Arts Council already do. Or you're just going to kind of do what you were going to do anyway and just make some more websites with it. Um, which are all actually fairly reasonable responses and fairly good explanations of kind of what has quite often happened. But as Andrew says, the real step change was, was saying, no, actually, it's not a load of pilots at 30K. It's a proper large-scale intervention. You know, I'm producing West End musicals. You can make a couple of West End musicals on there. You can make one anyway. Um, you can make something pretty big next door on this sort of size. So um, we've got to step up and do something of a certain scale. So to persuade them, I wrote the following load of rubbish. Um, so. And it worked. Um, uh, lots of other people did a lot more work than me, but the, the, we, we led this off in a meeting that said, so I want you to cast your minds forward to 2022. It's the biggest opening night of the West End season. Let's say, for instance, it's the sequel to Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. It's a one-of-a-kind moment in the history of commercial theater. The production uses amazing new media for marketing and audience, and audience engagement. The experience in the venue is unique and goes far beyond the foyer crush of old. The design and staging of the show is only possible because of advances in stage technology, fabrication, and production processes. And what about the piece? What's the format of the work itself? It's not a play as such. It has elements of interactivity and immersion. It begins before the performance and continues after it. It's outside and inside the venue. It's across digital media. Maybe it's participative. Whatever it is, it shows what the best creators, technologists, and theatre practitioners can do with the latest tools. And it captures the attention of the world. And how did this happen? Well, in 2018, and this is before we got this, by the way, as part of its visionary industrial strategy, the UK established the world's most forward-looking and large-scale research and development program to explore and implement the use of immersive and interactive technologies in theatre and performing arts. The aim was to increase profitability, drive financial resilience, create new jobs and new kinds of jobs, and thus increase the diversity of the workforce, and generally to build on the UK's world-class creative industries and performance businesses and take them in previously unthought of directions. Oh, and to do it quickly. The method was to make amazing experiences that audiences would love. And that's what we've got to do. It's really straightforward, isn't it? Um, 
that, that kind of vision of it is the broadest possible vision. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, bring up Sarah Ellis from the RSC is going to come up first. We're going to talk about what Andrew just said, what I've just said, what she's learned. We're not going to try and construct a consortium live on the stage. That's not really the plan um, because, you know, if, if we were, we'd do it in the form of contemporary dance if we were going to do that anyway, try and bring people together. Um, we're not going to try and do that. We're going to explore opportunities, difficulties. What does it really mean? What I think I would start by saying, and I'll say this again in a moment, is it means what we collectively as a sector define it to mean at this point in time. So do you want to come and have a chat? So Sarah's, um, Sarah's got no prep. I've not done any prep for this, so this will be exciting, won't it? So we'll sit down and share, shall we? <laughs> um, I think we're on every mic, are we? Can you hear us? Yeah. We're theatre people, we'll go diaphragm if not. Um, so, um, so how, do you, how do you react to what you've heard this morning, firstly, and then we'll get into some detail? Um, well, to be honest, it's, what's great about this is that um, we have an opportunity and it's ours to lose in our sectors. And actually it's about what, like how you just spoke there, it's about what happens after 2020. What can this pivot, what change can this make to all our work? Um, but also it's live performance or performance or, or the all the strands that you're talking about have an opportunity to have relevance um, speak to audiences and I think that in terms of our audiences we share so many of those audiences so often when we talk about ourselves in the sector we're talking about ourselves and actually this is an opportunity to talk about each other and and what happens when you multiply that. So it's not an equation of one plus one plus one in a consortia setting, but yeah. um, two times two times two times two. So how can that impact go further? And um, it's also that we are really um, ambitious um, people around experiences, and, and but we've always been that way. It's, these experiences have been immersed, immersive for centuries, yeah. and there are skills within that that, that need to be have a spotlight on them. Yeah. as well so when we use these technologies actually these are tools for us to um, do what we're doing already in some ways around innovation but actually um, get us to critically think about that working new spaces we, we, we world build all the time we yeah. create this becomes a world this stage becomes a world and that yeah. whether it's AR VR whatever you want to call it um, con we are content organizations that want to have a relationship with an audience every day so we're sitting on the original platform for augmented reality, one yeah. of these things. This has been, this is virtual reality. This yeah. is just one big, huge headset. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that's a wonderful thing. Let's not do it that way. Um, so, so, <laughs> right, so let's get into what it might be. In my kind of pitchy nonsense thing, I, I, was, I think I framed the opportunity in, in lots of, in three or four, if you like, sort of strands, and I've heard you We've known each other a while, but I've heard you speak uh, to similar strands, mm -hmm. so I'm going to mercilessly crib you. So that there's a bit about what the art is, sort of what the work is, and you just said world building, which I think yeah. is really fascinating. So in my career, when I've worked most on things that are can be worlds, TV dramas, Doctor Who, things like Harry Potter, they 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 lend themselves to this sort of very I'm not saying 360 because that's something else now, but this kind of thought through, rounded way of thinking. Um, so there's, there is what is the work, there is how is the work sort of presented in performance, so that's B2. Mm. There's what the hell you've got to do to make the work, which is different. And then I've got this obsession, because I'm a commercial producer, with how the audience experience, marketing, immersion, um, shareability, those bits are part of the way the work is made and received and continue to be made. Yeah. Are they, are they, are, is that a credible way of thinking, I and mean, then three of those are yours anyway, but is that a credible way of at least starting to address the question? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think in terms of the pervasiveness is that the, the, the stages that we operate in are bleeding out across multiple platforms. And so, for example, if you look at performance, what you're sort of talking about is real-time experiences and how, what um, we do really well is hold space. So it's how we can hold and be live or create liveness or real-time experiences, whether that is a mobile phone, whether that is a stage like this, all of which need a technology pipeline underpinning that that needs to, to work across that. Yeah. So actually, when we talk about building new stages, which you referenced earlier, I don't think we want to build new theatres, but we certainly want to build pipelines 
that can work across stages and can work across what our, our theatrical spaces are. Right. Um, and what I mean by that is, yes, there is a, a virtuous circle around the art and the commercialization of that. Yeah. And if we are to reach multiple audiences, it's really important that they have the best experience possible that brings them into that art space but that's still an art space that, that those barriers are, are are not there anymore that no and, and that's an interesting point particularly for a theater audience in a big subsidized house as we sit in a big subsidized house that we did have there, there's a kind of simplistic view of that argument that there's the state subsidized and there's the commercial <coughs> industries and and we didn't have to have that discussion here because we, we made it clear, and I think you just said in a, in a more eloquent way about the art, that actually the, 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 the ecosystem is so interrelated anyway. And as a commercial producer, I would say actually if you didn't have the subsidised houses in theatre, for instance, the innovation levels would be minimal in large parts of the UK. And theater. that's what's great about this particular opportunity is it puts us together in a, in a more formalised way or a more open way where we can maybe have that conversation. But we, as a subsidised theatre, we are also thinking commercially. We, we have to yeah. think of our, our business streams and our income streams. But audiences are critical to that business. We're content organisations. We create content that's then to be shared with an audience. And that our, audience, our audiences, or audiences in general, do not think in a siloed way. No. And that if we can break that siloed work, um, ways of if we can break those silos, then we are have a much better chance in 2020, 2021 of making um, any four of those strands scale, but also lead the way. So for me, it's about not reacting and seeing innovation happen over here. We should be at the heart of that innovation. We should be driving that around audience experience because our industries know what how to cultivate that ritual which is the fundamental things that the rituals around audience experience have fundamentally changed and we're still in that experimentation phase but that will land over the next five to ten years people will make decisions about how those audiences uh, right. experience that work and so i mean what we're not into is a kind of duality about it's either virtual reality or theater which is helpful because quite often these technology one of the really fund fundamental distinctions in this program I think versus a lot of government intervention in general is as Andrew said a couple of times and he under he in a way if anything he underplayed the importance of this is content led it's experience that it's not primarily technology led. Um, can, can we explore that and that kind of idea connected to collaboration so you know lots of us will have talked about Tempest and, and in fact I've been on platforms when you're talking about Tempest in different bits of the world we're not talking about the Tempest particularly but in in terms of this collaboration or these collaborations yeah. that we might fund here yeah. what are the characteristics of a successful collaboration and the second the rider question for that is how do you work in this this money's got to be and we described it as pre-commercial now that doesn't mean it doesn't earn any tickets it means it's got to be collaborative it can't be a sort of closed shop the pre i think the pre-commercialization is that you proof of concept commercial ideas that can be exploited later right i would argue yep. therefore that's what the subsidized theater setting has done matilda did that really well yeah. it had the time had the infrastructure to experiment and then create high quality product that then was exploited commercially and 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 i think that subsidized work does not mean you don't think entrepreneurial no problem. doesn't mean you don't think um commercially but what it does give you are some really strong um, methodologies and principles around making the work that um, that take a maybe a longer amount of time but also in the subsidized sector we're much i hope we are about shared learning we are about um, ways that we can work together and talk to each other and we're connected in that way but i think the three areas are technical build um, the experience itself and then the content distribution dissemination i think those three have to work together and when you're looking at the technology build and the new technology pipeline, <coughs> your need, you have to think about your furthest reach point. Explain that some more to me. What so it's not good enough just to think about technology as an infrastructure. Technology is about new forms of distribution, and that technology pipeline needs to, to connect with ubiquitous technology which people have already at that, their hands, such as a mobile phone or, or any experience. Um, that technology conversation can't just be on its own. It has to have the audience in the room when it's being created and being built. And through that R&D, 
um, there'll be points where you don't take forward certain parts of that R&D because it's not quite ready to get into that commercial is that, that, is that a challenge then in the context of a three yeah. theatre production? But, yeah, it's that, absolutely it's, challenge. You know, lots of it. It, I mean, certainly, I hadn't done it for 15 years until I came back into it recently, and I'm still looking at white card models, which I find extraordinary. So, lots of production is not developed um, alongside um, technology, largely because of cost or capital investment. Yeah, I mean, there's no point trying to do everything, and then it gets to an audience, and they go, "What was that?" What was and that? you go, "I'm sorry about that. We tried that, and it just didn't work. It's, that's not good enough for an audience relationship." No. So, you you have to you have to look at what your the main objective and what the experience is and allow the tech when people are creating those um, technical builds that they have the opportunity to fail in that space as you would any actor or any artist failing in rehearsal yeah. but then you have to have the sensibility and the maturity I think to make the cuts according to to making the best um, experience possible if you're creating something for 2020 it's lovely to say you've never been done before first time you ever did it but if it doesn't work that audience, you've lost that audience, so it has to have a robustness around that, and that's why the audience being in the room on the prototyping and the research and the R and D is really crucial. Yeah. Um, otherwise, we talk to ourselves as well, uh, effectively. Um, talk about. Let's talk a little bit about then the kind of form of the work. So one of the things I enjoy most and learn most from in my life is I'm chair of Blast Theory. Um, Chairman's in the room, uh, who you know are, in my view, have been at the leading edge of a lot of immersive type performance in, uh, and, and other work for a, a quite a long time now. How, did, how, and how can that kind of work, that kind of sensibility interconnect with a, pro, a project like this? You know, are we potentially, is, is this about a dramatic world where different ways of looking at the story are done by different institutions, where different technologies are used in different contexts of a dramatic world? Or is it, is it you know, let's make a play in a, in a more immersive, more engaging sort of way, and that's all we're going to do? What do you think we should be looking for? I think there needs to be equity across institutions and, and companies like Blast Fury. Absolutely. We need to be learning from each other. Right. It's not a, a... Could you look at scale just in institution? I think scale can work in, in, in a Blast Fury context as well. And that, yeah, you can come around... I think it needs a shared objective and a shared idea around the audience. Um, I think that um, you need to look at live experience and from, from my perspective. Uh, I would suggest um, what are all the digital derivatives of that that experience, and how can you reach the hundred thousand? In you know, how do you talk about reaching that that so that's, target? That's content strategy in other bits of my life. I mean, that's thinking about content strategy right at the beginning as a set of objectives. Strategy is going for me. Strategy is going. Here's all the things we might do, and here's how we're going to know how to prioritise which ones. Yeah, and I think that every collaborator can take one of those questions away, can't they? And bring okay. them back to the table. That's a I mean, that would, that would be a good idea because then you're looking at where the areas of expertise are. For example, we don't know everything about, um, we would work with the expert and, and then bring and bring that shared expertise in a coalition of thinking. Um, the execution of that work may vary according to each content organisation, but I think undeniably right now um, there is a shared interest in what do these technologies do? How do they relate to audiences? How can our sectors thrive in that? And how can we push that? And how do we not talk to ourselves? And how do we not replicate uh, what's been done previously with um, what I would call um, two screen technologies, or for example, what is the new form? What is the new language? What is the new way of making this work? And how do we use, how do we, how do we bring that thinking together collegiately um, cannot happen in, um, in, any in a silo, in, in any one way, because ultimately we need a diversity of content going out there for audiences, for, for audience pickup. If we homogenise how we make this work, that's pretty limiting, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. From an imaginative, from, a, from an imagination perspective. So that that strongly argues for the same approach to technological to, to, to technological collaborators as well, then. So there may be very particular specialisms that are large-scale companies that where you need colossal amounts of computation, for instance, live animation, live rendering sort of work. Or there might be very detailed interactive narrative design questions, which are you know there's a writer and there's somebody who you know can can you know do extraordinary things in in um, tiny tiny um, interactive narrative design. Um, and what's brilliant so, is when you get that analog and digital um, world working. So for example. You know, um, I'd say 
who are we not welcoming into our spaces and how we make our work, what skills are out there that, you know, wonderful worlds that, wonderful sectors that are being created that are talking, you know, creating work in their worlds and how do you create that alchemy? So for example, paper is a technology, let's bring that into the space. That should be absolutely the same as a code or a programmer. How do you, from for, for, for this to coexist, it's like, let's not disenfranchise a, a new set of people. Um, uh, let's bring our mainstream audiences with us on that front because if you want to look at business model we absolutely need to bring a mainstream audience with us right. so we can't we can't create something in the world that doesn't speak ubiquitously or, or have a connection we can take risk in that in R&D absolutely and if we ask those questions when we're looking at the technology and we're looking at the content creation but um, I, I do genuinely think that um, when we look at, well, when a theatre company looks at, say, like a games engine, for example, we're looking at it from a very different lens to that coder or program or games developer that's made that. Yeah. Um, it, in terms of collaboration and this sort of type of consortia, I would say that both those people are right and both those people are wrong. What's the third way? What, so the, I genuinely think it's actually what happens after 2020. And as much as, um, there were firsts on the Tempest that we did. There was a hundred thirsts backstage that no one saw. Yeah. And I would argue on this consortia and how these collaborations are set up, it is about all the hundred firsts that you can articulate in that application as well that can game change. Because it's, 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 for example, we look at the content we will create, but actually we, if, if you've got this level of investment and this level of opportunity, um, you can make significant cultural shift in how we actually make our work. And I think, to be honest, I think that's really exciting. I mean, I think that's, that will be what hopefully we ultimately, this whole thing, the people who do the work achieve. Just to close them, to think about the maximum benefit that we can, that this kind of intervention can deliver, not because, as, in, as you're saying, not because of the 100,000 audience members, but because of the way it changes the way that work happens or the way in which new tools are made available, the way in which we sort of share this public investment. Because, you know, the, the UK could be spending this money on something else. We How do we ensure stuff is shared properly and is open? Because, you know, the academic collaborators here will have a different view of that, to, for instance, to a very commercial collaborator. What would be, and we haven't genuinely haven't talked about this, what would be your sort of guidelines on how we work in terms of what we expect to be shared, how we expect the sector broadly to benefit from this investment. You really are getting unfiltered, aren't you, Steve? So, Mate, um, I told you, um, I, mean, um, you know, I don't know the answer. So. Uh, I, no, I, if we say we're going to collaborate, we need to mean it, and that's the collaboration's hard. Collaboration gives compromise. You're, we'll disagree at certain points as a sector. Um, we have to genuinely, um, uh, where, wherever success occurs, then there is, um, we have to share it because um, we're not a big enough sector to not share. And actually, and I don't mean that um, we're not big enough in our ambition, we really are ambitious and we really, really want to make work that um, where real time or performance, in our case, theatre is leading the way in the, t in the technology space because it can and it should. Um, but it is about, um, we could set up. Um, 10 different tracks where we're all looking at the same things um, but in different ways if that makes any sense so we're all in our competitive head and we're going to go we're going to do an RSC version yet you've got 10 people looking at the same problem that really isn't a content organization problem it's a fundamental way of how we make these immersive experiences work right so the sector then is closing in on itself and actually if we shared those tech pipelines if we shared those skills and learnings or freelancer lists uh, or whatever it is to make that work possible, um, we will make better work. So it's kind of creating, um, and it's really hard to do because you, you, you want to be certain points, but it's know, know yourself, know, know what you're good at, like yourself for your strengths, know yourself for your weaknesses, and, and don't think that we're not dealing with the same questions. We are. We're not working in isolation. We will want to be making, we all want to be making similar work. Um, and there, be, but there are points where we have to respect the privacy of that. So, for example, we have to respect the, the sensitivities around um, uh, what work you want to make and, uh, and asking those questions in quite closed spaces. And it's pivoting on that. And I think that if this can create some culture change where we're not working in these 
you know, pathways of we're all trying to make a piece of this or a piece of that, but actually if we collectively went, okay, well, what if theatre um, looked at um, this, this way of making work? How would we do that together? And then how would our different companies do that in different ways? So what's the RSC version? Right. What's the Blast Theory version? What's the Marshmallow Laser Piece version? Whatever. That's the bit that makes it different, and then that goes back into the ecology of audience. So it's what's the identity of that work using a similar technology pipeline, which they're not going to be that different. And that's the expensive part I, I've witnessed is the expensive part is the, is, is, the, is the build always and the new technologies coming through, which have hard costs, which if we shared our tech, that would make our lives a lot easier, wouldn't it, in, in that sense? And it's a very simple thing to do. Um, but there's also something really important about respecting each other's work and going, you know what, I really loved Draw Me Close, I really loved Five National, I really loved, um, I think Punch Drunk still win it in, in terms of that immersive experience that you can see other companies are trying to emulate, and I'm not gonna name check anymore because that's wrong, but um, my point is, is that if we started looking at each other about what you're really good at, it may sound very trite or, or very naive, but actually I think that would change the way we work together, genuinely so. Um, and I'm very jet lagged and very off the hoops. So, um, so, uh, I, um, I you you did an sense. extraordinarily good job of that, thank you, because I didn't give you any easy no, questions though, did I? No, you didn't give me any easy No, look, that was, that was a start and a really brilliant one um, from a practical point of view. So, uh, uh, round of applause for Sarah, and I'm going to move on. <laughs> Um, two more um, responses. So Annette Mays, who, who's Annette's over there, um, head of the New Orleans Lab at Royal Opera House, and for Darren Costa, Darren's over there. Look, it's great, isn't it? It's like they're coming in from different sides. It's almost like we planned to have a seat. Have a seat, stage enters. Um, yeah, what, what Sarah just said from your point of view. So, um, um, different perspectives. So, um, you can introduce yourself, um, um, and you can introduce what you currently do, and then I'll give you a question. So, Annette. Uh, my name is Annette Mace. I am relatively new in position at the Royal Opera House where I'm setting up an audience lab which specifically looks at uh, how to create new experiences using new technology, so this, this. basically. Uh, and I'm currently putting an initial program together that's both about experimentation and about projects and trying to figure out how we build a pipeline of talent and new discovery that leads to opening up an art form like ours, I've got opera and ballet, to new audiences. Where does it go? And before that, so you were, we worked together when you were a creative yeah. fellow at the space when I was there? Uh, so my background is originally as a theatre director basically, uh, specifically with an expertise in a massive and interactive theatre. I run a company called Coney, a small MPO that really looks at interactivity for good a decade mm -hmm. and then became a creative fellow with Wired and the space and really delved deeper into the possibilities of technology. So I'm bringing it back together again. There you are. Once meets the tech. So that's you. Um, Dan? Hi, yeah, um, so I'm the University of Bath, I'm a kind of director of a lab called Camera and which would be a bit of it, so Camera where the center of the analysis of motion, entertainment research and applications. And um, we're, 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 we're a university, we're in the university, um, what we do is we do a lot of research in the area of in the creative industries. I mean, the, the science bit then is also looking at how you translate creative technology across to other things. And that is a, a, a sport in medicine. But I think, so our thing, well, my personal thing, you know, even back since my PhD, has been on motion capture and motion analysis. And I guess that's where I kind of, yeah. um, I'm going to, it's the motion capture kind of no interest in this thing. Um, and, um, you know, where, at Canberra, we do a lot of work with, uh, we do a lot of motion capture research. We also do a lot of, uh, we do a lot of individual UK projects. Um, so we worked with the uh, um, Imaginarium um, for, on, on a few projects. And I remember the, when our, the Tempest was kind of happening and the guys were getting really, you know, the guys were stressed out. No one of my Nobody was stressed out. Was, uh, <laughs> and it's, in, it's interesting, but, um, and they were a lot, they, they were a lot of, there were, were hundreds of things in the background actually that were really interesting points. So I do remember, I do remember the, the really the first going on, and that was uh, that was interesting. Um, so, I mean, yeah. So what, what we try and do though in our lab is we try and put the re put the research into the studio. So when we do commercial work, then someone can come and take and, and someone can come and use that. 
And uh, we've also, um, you know, on the opera side, we were involved with uh, the Man and Butterfly WNO Rewind mm -hmm. things. We did a motion capture for that, and we've done a few things where we've captured performance and we've tried to use it. So there's a lot of potential in that area. Uh, yeah. Lots and lots. Fantastic. So, so from what you've heard so far, I'll start with you. you know, in your mind's eye now, mm -hmm. what's, what, what do you see in this is? What, 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 where are you seeing the exciting opportunities for? Uh, I think the, the thing that I'm really excited about is uh, the scale of the investment because I think it allows, when I look at what well, Opera House isn't small, um, but it can only experiment in so many directions simultaneously where this is such um, an unknown beast. So, for example, when we talk about reaching audiences and experimenting with audience reach and where it goes and the footprint of this and, and that sort of real link into who's this for and where is it going to go, there's only so much experiment we as a single house can do with that. We sort of can experiment a bit with the work, but then it also has to land every time. So actually being able to do that as a sector together to think about how our expertise of creating worlds, um, as Sarah said, uh, by bringing together storytelling with music, with drama, with all of those things in, uh, I think there's so much expertise in the sector to really experiment with how that translates onto these new stages, onto these new ways of storytelling and these new ways of distributing and talking to audiences. I think that's exciting. And what are you seeing, Darren? That you know, it can be as broad as you like. I don't want just mocap, yeah, because I know you know a great deal about a lot of other things. What are you? Uh, not necessarily as the technology seal on in, on the table or on the panel, but you know what what things do you think are most interesting, challenging, have highest potential in terms of new ways of working in tech and relationships between tech and experience? Yeah. So um, just just to say one thing, I haven't really thought of before coming today was the fact that we're using immersive in the build up. Uh -huh. And the kind of not just the show, but actually the build up. And I actually see that's a really interesting angle. But, but um, so, I mean, I, I see, I've seen in the past kind of all these, these great, I guess, one off mm -hmm. things happening. And um, I think, you know, so even, even with kind of the things like the, even with the Tempest, there was a lot of work just went into that. And I think it would be really great to kind of see a bit democratization of that right. kind of that kind of experience and, you know, being able to um, kind of make that technology ubiquitous and, and, and kind of, and, and also, you know, in the, also in the, in the building of that experience as well, in the production side, kind of innovation in that production side, maybe using virtual production from remote locations and, you know, the place where you're actually going to work in is, is, a, is a virtual environment and you're kind of doing Pusher production and set dressing and all these kind of things in that environment, um, and then there is there's obviously then that I think an, another I'm mean, not not completely performance capture because I see a lot of um, I don't we talk about that, but um, making things interactive as well and having the audience. I think one we, we can I am going to show you, sorry when you, <laughs> when you when you capture when you capture performances and you capture things they're bottled up. And they're, and they're captured. So how do you make that intelligent and reactive? And how do you make that a unique experience as well? So, so what opportunity to kind of yeah, to make, to talking about sort of some, somewhere where motion cap meets games engines meets kind of machine learning that exactly, responds, yeah. narrative response stuff that actually you were doing with various of us done in limited sort of bits of paper sort of do? way. <laughs> it's the stuff that improvisation does. I, I once I once put together a workshop with a bunch of VR um, academics and some theatre directors, Fanny McDermott and Peter Sellers and various opera directors, and they spent the entire time talking about what real what wasn't real mm -hmm. and how the important thing was what you left out in improvisation and how authenticity mattered more than simulation mm -hmm. and how actually virtual reality isn't as interesting yeah. as heightened or yeah, yeah. you know enhanced um, which was really interesting because the, the technologists came into the room going yeah but we want to know how to make it look more like it's true yeah mm -hmm. and the answer to true was not real um, I think that's partly but, to do because there's so much cinematography in the sector right. and actually I mean, the Royal Opera House, what do you ever say? We don't do real. We're not really interested no. in real. We're interested in heightened. We're interested in, in, in indicating something that, that shows so much more. Um, and I think, I think bringing that language and that way of thinking about 
what set is, where does an, an audience imagination fill in everything, um, how you think non-literally within these new worlds. I right. think that's what we bring, I think, and I think we need space to then, then be able to really get to grips with that and really do, um, develop our own vocabulary within it, but there's so much performance can bring to how one creates a world, which is so separate and completely distinct from cinema or any other art form for that matter. Right, I think there's kind of two things as well. That, so yeah, you, you could, the interactivity thing, does, I think it does open a lot of, you know, maybe you don't want heightened reality, but you want that interaction, and you may have to compromise anyway from that respect, because if you want something to be really hyper real and immersive, you're really pushing the technology level then, to something which is really, really tough to do, to have, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, but if you do, you can go the other way. If you don't want the interactive, another the thing which springs around my head when I think about this as well is, after you know, capturing something for posterity's purposes as well, why not go for the medium and just kind of bottle something, capture the highest fidelity and highest realism, whether it's an orchestra or an opera, you know, you've got sound capture, you've got the visual, you've got maybe fully motion captured, volumetric capture, just just capturing something, and then and then touring that around the world as well, you know, bringing that out to right. people. So you can go hyper real, bottle something, it's there forever. It's in more, you know, or bringing back someone from the dead or something, you know. I'm doing that. I'm doing yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, and we've got the let's go for the interactive. So there's also different. Kinds it, of it brings up lots of in, that brings up lots of interesting questions about what you're actually making at that point, doesn't it? So I don't know if people, many people in the room have done live streams of, show, of shows. I've, I've exact a couple, and they're really fascinating problems because you don't really know what you're making and you don't know what the audience experience is and you know it's not TV and you know it's not really cinema and then you sit in the room with the people in the, in, as I did in you know, cinema and it's still not the thing you thought you were making because they're responding to it differently again but you have those kind of very visceral components to it. Quality of sound is fundamental in suddenly in a way that actually you know you get away with sometimes in live performance uh, you know almost all musicals are terrible really in terms of quality of sound for instance um, so sound I think feels like it's underplayed quite often to me in a lot of these conversations. You do a lot of sound work, I mean, working with people, everybody seems to be obsessed with visual capture, yeah. and actually the, the ears are tricked and the ears lead so much more strongly quite often than the eyes. Does that, is that a leading edge area in, in I mean, the business for you? For, I mean, there, there, are, there are guys in our lab doing audio rendering, and I think there are, there are big research centres in the UK looking at spatial audio and audio rendering. Right. You know, and 3D audio, I mean, University of Surrey's got, I'm not going to just talk about, yeah. you know, University of Arthur Camera, but University of Surrey's got EPSC program grants on spatial audio, audio rendering. It is, it is, it is a really, it is, it is underplayed, I think, in this respect. And I, I think in the performance, you know, in the performance sector as well, I do I do think about the tempest and I think about but there is the, and the visual side, but there is the sound. And even talking to um, you know people from, for example, the Phil Philharmonia Orchestra. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and something 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 nobody's ever done before is how do you capture like an entire orchestra sonically and visually? Because actually nobody really even knows. That yeah. They really study even the intricate tiny things that go on. on. I think for us, sound is so vital. Obviously, because it's intrinsic to the art form and it's why people come. Yeah. There is no seat in the opera where you, where you can't hear it. There are seats where you can't see it. Yeah. Um, as you know, I come out of a long, long time ago out of film originally, and you know, day one in film school, they show you a uh, a horror film with the with the sound turned off, mm -hmm. and they show you like CCTV grainy stuff with the sound with the sound turned off. Like sound is one of the most important signifiers in cinema and storytelling and it's underplayed in theatre, it's always got underplayed in theatre, not for us. But we're talking, like we're talking to Arab about sound out away from theatres because they're used to thinking about sound spatially, they're thinking about sound quality when they're building, you know, concert halls. How do we think about that when we make work that's no longer place here, how do we yeah. think about sound, how do we think about that in space, because it's fundamental to the emotional layer, which is so fundamental to our art form, the emotion is in the music. So, so and then what about play, playing to another sort of angle, what about interaction then? Darren raised it earlier, so um, um, I've worked on um, James Graham's privacy at the Don Mars, the interaction consultant, and it's really, really hard putting interactivity into live performance plays. 
um, and it's, you know, you've done it in your work at Cody and elsewhere and, and, in, and, 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 in, and in James, but how do we, do we need to avoid, the answer to this is clearly yes, do we need to avoid this just becoming about the kind of digitization of existing performances? And, and if so, how do we bring in people who are writing new forms of immersive narrative? How do we ensure that actually that's part of this mm. conversation? Because at this kind of moment, a lot of that work's happening at this kind of size, or there's a limited number of companies. So yeah. how do you bring those in? Who are they? Is it writers? Is it, who do we need to get reach out to who are not part of the institution? I mean, I, I have very strong opinions about this, quite obviously. Uh, well, because I've made interactive work for in theatrical yeah. settings for 10, 15 years. Yeah, I and I think, I think, I think what one often does from an institution point of view is, is chuck a, uh, a generic creative team at it and let them play around with interactivity. And actually, you have to, from the very beginning, work on it. I think people who are amazing at writing set plays can sometimes be great at writing interactivity, but also cannot be. And I think having space to work iteratively about how one creates something one wants to say, but leave enough space for the audience to actually be part of it is really important. I think iterative processes are really important, so fill with audiences. Um, because the audience is so important, you can't do all the thinking behind closed doors and not invite an audience in to be part of that journey. I think it's about upskilling uh, existing talent in new ways. I think it's bringing in thinking from the games industry, which thinks well about at least sandbox uh, interactivity. Nice. Um, there is so much um, thinking to be done about how one brings the right teams and the right expertise together over a timeline to get to work that's actually valid it is really important. So that sounds like actually by the end of 2020 there should have been a lot of activity heading towards <coughs> a, maybe a centerpiece or a, or a showcase rather than all your eggs in one basket. So I think for me what's really interesting about this as a Royal Opera House is I hope that this create a talent pipeline that by the end by 2020 there are 17 more writers who can think like this right. that there are 24 more vr companies that uh, really are excited about working with non-photorealistic as an um, aesthetic that there are just theater designers that can think 360 where they currently think like this so for me it's about upskilling a performance industry to take advantage of the new commercial opportunities that are in the near future. Well, how does that relate to the research sort of community then? Who do we need to bring in? What, what's happening that we really need to be aware of? Yeah, I mean, so that is that is the you know the interesting thing. It's kind of talking about you know I guess it's kind of there is a divide between the world slightly as well. So on the one hand, you kind of there you want to create, and I, we get the guys in our studio and we do productions. We've had it, got two commercial shots on this month, and we're this year, and the guys are in there, and then the, all the you know all our monkey guys are sitting there waiting, and they're all doing their rehearsal, and they may as well be mm. kind of on stage. But we, you, you need to give them the tools as well to play with. And when we've done motion, so we do motion capture training school, training classes with the old theatre school, mm. and they put the we do the real time kind of virtual character stuff. You know, they're on the screen, they can see I'm Spider Man, I'm on top of a building. They put VR headsets on, they're looking at each other. It's all great fun. And then we switch it all off because they're all getting distracted. And then they may as well be at, you know, on stage again. See, but and they come back to the point about what works and what do you throw away as well. I mean, and and the, on the interaction side, again, the, the danger is that you. So yes, actually, you work with the game guys, the video game people, because that's what they do. They're doing non-linear narrative. They're in that. There's a sandbox, but that's what they're doing. They're making compelling stories there. But it's the technology side as well. The risk is that even within the course of this performance, these, these demonstrators you won't have had the technology to really play with before you get into it as well. So you need to, I think you need to be very careful at the start what technology you start to introduce mm. in at the start. So coming on to the re interactive reactive part. Yeah. Um, you could you, you know you could do simple things like, you know, if you've got pre-recorded performance, one simple thing is make make it look like the character's acting for you and then maybe do some <coughs> simple and scripted intelligent events where the character reacts. And what if you want the audience member to speak to the character as well. Then you need sort of natural language processing, a sound recognition, a voice recognition, how far do you want to push that? Yeah. And then you need an environment which is controlled as well. You can't have an environment maybe 
you know, where there's other noise in the kind of background. I mean, the technology is like robust technologies, but again, these are not these things that we tried out. Right. So again, we may by the end, we you know, we may by the end of this program, we again have chucked away 50 potential solutions to do something, and left with something which yeah. kind of works and something which actually is needed there, but needs another two years. So I think mm. the, the really the yeah, I mean, you can take what you've got now, the sandbox of toys you've got now, and play with it in a kind of production setting. And I think it would be nice at the same time to have a few strands, let's try some voice recognition, let's try some intelligent kind of motion graph based character animation stuff, which intelligently adapts to what you're doing. You know, some kind of some recognition of your motion, or maybe a motion capturing you at the same time, so I can help do that as well, motion capturing you based right. on your action, kind of. Also, you're picking this up, and I do something. Like when you do that, I'm going to do this, and it's kind of acting to you. But so I need to be carefully designed, and I think that hopefully the role of you know, well, there is a research role and a technology research role in here somewhere as well. And I guess it depends on how you want to push these demos to the programs as well. Do you want to push that technology to the limits and see what works and what breaks, yeah. or are you pushing the stage production to the limits with, you know? You know, making that pipeline, that you know, robust for just real-time motion capture of characters and virtual headsets. So there's mm -hmm. engineering stuff which is kind of low risk and getting it working could be one technology outcome, or introducing some really high risk stuff, which is really a first. You know, we were, you know, are you are talking to this completely digital character and it's reacting to you. Right. I mean, so it depends where you want to go with this, but I guess it's up to us, right? Does yeah, it, it is. And, and, and Andrew laid out the whole program as well. You know, so there's the collaborative R and D components to it, which could be very much at the kind of, you know, what happens when you have a deep learning machine system with an AI in it that actually is able to, you know, be I don't know, Malvolio on his day off. I don't know what it yeah. is. It's not that. Um, but you know, what, how, do, how, how does that affect the, the, the process of creating? Because it, 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 the program's got to work in its own right and across its own sort of um, targets and, and um, KPIs, etc. But as people keep saying, and it is right, you know, we, we're none of us thinking this is it. This is the last time we're now ever going to get in the R&D <laughs> industries. You know, we managed to get a big enough bit of wall and pull it over the eyes of them once, and so cracking will spend all this. And there'll never be any more. You know, this is nine percent of the UK economy. This sector. It's, you know, is proper, should be properly part of this. Um, and, and, and likewise, from a sort of university strategy point of view, UKLR point of view, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to ensure that these investments and the clusters' investments change in quite significant ways the way the architecture yeah. of the university system works, not only at research, but also so that people start to understand that actually undergraduate courses in areas like this are really very significant parts of the kind of long-term economic viability of, of the country, you know, etc. So there's there's a lot of jobs this money's got to do, but rightly so. I mean, we're, you know, by the time we get this in the clusters, we're heading for mm -hmm. probably the best part of 180 million quid. And I think you know, it's, it's good to, to think about separating a little bit. Um, I can't remember how Sarah put it earlier, but she was talking as well about part, a very strong part of this for me is putting stuff in front of an audience. Yeah. And it just needs to be robust, it just needs to work. And actually trying to figure out how to put stuff out there that works in what format. Like, if the Royal Opera House made a The Void experience, what the hell would that look like? That That's two, two years worth of thinking right there. Mm. It, um, simultaneously, I think we can start experimenting with what are, the, what are the over the horizon technologies that would layer on top of that. But there is a, I think there's a real interesting conversation about how we layer innovation, tech, technological innovation with how we layer that with artistic innovation. So, you know, when electricity came in, theatre wasn't immediately good at using it, but it was so quite quickly because it experimented with what, it, what electricity meant and it was stable. Versus how do we talk about this to audiences who don't even know they want to go to a royal opera house in an avoid, in a void model? Like what, is, what are the stories we're gonna tell? How do we tell the story about those stories? Um, I think, so there's, a, there's several layers to it. And again, I think it's about trying to find a cluster and a way of collaborating where those expertises can coexist and support each other and become one conversation about what's over the horizon post 2020. Right. Um, but also really don't forget the audiences and bringing them in and, and like what is the journey that we're going on with them? How do we grow that audience? That was, that's a good, good point on which to bring it to an end for lunch really because we, certainly when we were putting together the proposal, 
the reason for saying these things have got to be big, one of the reasons, they're very big, they've got to have the ability to get this sort of audience scale, mm. was to sort of head off what I've seen a lot in sort of the years, and I'm sure many of us have, an attempt to do something technologically innovative, which was also trying to do something creatively innovative in, in terms yeah. of the story or the content or the characters in the same time, which yeah. gives you a kind of square of a problem. It doesn't yeah. give you two problems, it gives you the problem multiplied by yeah. a problem. And so you don't get an audience, so you can't test. So, you know, so I'm mildly obsessed with, with fandoms and how fandoms behave around um, properties and IPs and worlds and characters and actors, actually. Mm -hmm. you know, we can do the whole thing around Ben Cumberbatch, as far as I can say. Um, but, you know, so how you do something which actually responds to the things that drive the passionate relationship that happens between fans. And I saw some great new research recently suggesting that 78 to 85 percent of people in weird economies, Western educated, all those economies, describe themselves as a fan of something. It doesn't mean you're a fan, you know, where you've got everything ever made and you're pinned to your bedroom wall, but you are a fan of something because you have the characteristics of self-definition, because you're a fan of, or because you use it as social currency or whatever it is. You know, I'm, I'm cursed to be a fan of Bolton Wanderers. This is a thing. Um, so people are fans of stuff. And I think we sort of, that dimension of what drives people's emotional engagement mm. with, pro with stories, properties, worlds, characters, multiplied by all yeah. this, seems to me to be, that's one of the key design decisions. How do you start with that? Yeah. How do you find that nexus? Seems really important. And I that might be yeah. Shakespeare, or it might be you know Mozart, or it might be you know I don't know Charles Gambino. I don't know. I mean, what, what, I mean, yeah, I think, and, and also, so yeah, you, so that, that is really important to, to, to get onto it. But I think also, um, I've also seen some really bad immersive things as well. I've and, and, and and almost <laughs> only seen bad immersive yeah, exactly. things, and I think that's the thing as well. To my is like just. To, just you know, it doesn't make it better just because it's immersive as well. Yeah. I mean, I've, yeah. I mean, I think actually I've seen really good examples of technology yeah. with bad, with, yeah. with like you know, and, Great tech and they demos. Were, exactly they're open. The content would be better. So I think in all these kind of vehicles, the, you know, the fandom Sometimes. thing. How do you then? You know, you, you still need the great content, and I think it's then. What, 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 and I guess that's what we're trying to learn then. Mm -hmm. It's like. How does the immersive thing? Does, when does the immersive thing? Does, does it work with the idea you've got? And if it doesn't work, just don't use immersive because yeah. you can actually make it work into gimmick, and it's not very good in the first place. And I think that's now that is a good point. I'm going to leave it. That's a really good point because that, that's not for the sake of it, isn't it? Don't do it for the sake of it. Yeah. I mean, this is too big to do it for the sake of it. Actually, it's got to be too big to do it for the sake of it. Look, so we were not trying to solve anything there. We were just trying to explore possibilities. I'm sure we explored a limited number of them. You've got better questions than I had, um, but that means you've got half an hour to ask them of each other and of the people who've been on the panal because it's lunch. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Alan Costa and Annette Mays, um, for joining us.